going to enjoy this because she's a remarkable person. And you know what? She was a teacher once. And you're going to hear a little bit about that. You're going to hear about her journey, and you're going to hear about her mission. Would you please join me in welcoming Susan Scott? Thank you. Good morning. I'm so glad to hear that John is going to recover. I really like his work. I mean, you've probably discovered, like I have, that woe is me is not an attractive narrative, nor is it a very effective one. I got choked up while we were singing that song. Did anybody else get a little? Yeah, I really did. And part of it, you know, there, there's a lot about nature in there, rocks and rills and trees and mountains. And something personal about me, I actually live in a treehouse on Orcas Island off the coast of Washington. And if you're a treehouse fan, on Valentine's Day, my treehouse is going to be featured on a show called Ultimate Treehouses. It'll be um, on, it's on the animal planet. And they said it was going to be around 10 p.m. West Coast time, but you know, check your listings. But anyway, if you're, if you're curious, if you'd like to see where I live, um, and when they filmed it two weeks ago, in fact, I'm amazed I have it ready already. Um, I was, I had bronchitis so bad I could barely talk, so I really sounded pathetic, you know, in what I said. But you might, you might get a kick out of the show. I do want to tell you a story, and the story of, of where Fierce came from is deeply personal, um, and I, I have become quite comfortable with disclosure at a level that not everybody expects from me. I did make myself some notes because I was really kind of scrambling last night to prepare for this, so forgive me if I put on my glasses and I don't want to miss anything for you. But what we're going to cover together is, to me, hallowed ground. It is precious ground. It is the ground I have been personally and professionally traveling for the last about 17 years, and it has truly been the road that diverged in a yellow wood, and that has made all of the difference. There is a paradigm shift going on, um, certainly in the United States, based on some relatively recent history and some current history, anything from the economic meltdown and the resulting devastation on Wall Street and how so many of people around the world were keenly impacted and really have felt that. To um, those of us who have the privilege of observing our Congress and their ineffectiveness, and then to the, um, the, the heartbreaking things that happen, such as the violence that seems to be accelerating and happening more and more frequently. This morning on the Today Show, maybe some of you heard about this, there is a school in Salt Lake City, you heard about it, some of you, uh, where at lunchtime the kids have their, they put their food on the tray, they're moving their tray down the line, and when they get to the end, the person standing there says, your parents have not paid for your food. They took the trays away and dumped the food in the garbage. How does such a thing happen? How, can, how could any actual human being do that, even if they were ordered to do that? I mean, how could you do that? So there are a lot of things that are going on um, in huge organizations, in small organizations, in schools, in families that have helped us recognize that there is something fundamental missing from our skill set, our mindset, our strategy for navigating our way through our professional and our personal lives. And finally, for the first time, many people in organizations are getting the point that the topic of conversations 
is not a subject that belongs in the bucket called soft skills. It is essential. It is absolutely essential. Because we have seen over and over again that what gets talked about in an organization, how it gets talked about, and who is invited to that conversation absolutely determines what is going to happen. And just as importantly, what is not going to happen. And that is certainly true within schools. What gets talked about by superintendents and principals, by staff, by faculty, what happens in the classroom between a teacher and his or her students determines what is going to happen and what is not going to happen. It certainly determines the health of that culture, whether it's a large culture, a mini culture, such as a particular classroom. It determines the level of collaboration and cooperation and innovation. It determines the level of engagement in a classroom and ultimately then whether the students um, achieve their learning objectives and whether or not they go on to do really interesting things with their lives versus checking out, shutting down because they're bored or because they don't feel seen or heard or held able. There's one other distinction I want to make before I start telling you the story of Fierce, and that is that there is a tremendous difference, and I'm, I'm sure you recognize this, between communications and conversations. Communications is a huge topic. That could include advertising billboards. That can include posting stuff on Facebook. That is very, very different than a conversation. When you do surveys in organizations that are asking employees, you know, what, what, what's working, what isn't working, what would you like to see? The thing that comes up at number one over and over and over again is that employees say, we'd like better communication. Sadly, that is misinterpreted to mean they need more messaging. They need someone to stand up in front of them and tell them again what, what the mission is, what the vision is, what they're supposed to do. And that is not at all what people are asking for. People are longing for a conversation. So I'm going to do my best to provoke your thinking about that topic this morning. And I wish we had even more time. I don't want to skim through some key points, and so I really will slow down at some points and try to go a little bit deeper. I was talking with uh, someone at Microsoft not too long ago who said, you know, we, every, whenever there's going to be some kind of a training, if it's a two-day training, we always say, well, we don't have time for that. We want you to squeeze this two-day training into two hours, you know, maybe half a day. And she said, what we end up with is energized incompetence. Everybody is really excited at the end of the training, and they have not a clue as to what to do, you know, or how to do it. So, uh, and and the, the other thing I wanted to say is that even though we um, work with organizations and many of the largest organizations in the world globally, the division called Fierce in the Schools, or FITS for short, is by far the most important division to me personally and to the people on that team and really even the folks on our staff that work with corporations get it and support us completely. Because this will definitely be the most valuable legacy that we can leave. I think that you and I are doing everything that we can to solve the problems that we see in front of us. And we will leave much undone for the next generation. So we want to equip them with the skills, the mindset, the heart, the strategy for, for getting it right, not only for themselves, but for all of us, for all of the rest of us. In fact, Fierce Conversations, the book is a textbook in quite a few colleges and universities, and it's part of some MBA programs because there is an understanding we don't know how to do this. We don't know how. 
talking, having our mouths moving, is not a conversation, necessarily. Certainly not a fierce one, anyway. So I am really excited and thrilled and honored to be able to share with you something that has meant all of the world to me and continues to be a daily challenge. It is not easy, the fierce path. It is a way of life and constantly being challenged by it. You know, as, as educators, you've probably noticed that we tend to teach that, what, that which we ourselves most need to learn and understand. So we go deeper, deeper, deeper. I've had my nose rubbed in my fierce material for many, many years, and I'm still learning, still learning, still making mistakes from time to time and course correcting to get it back where it needs to be. So I hope that what I'm going to share with you lands in a powerful way. I hope that all of us, myself included, will be different when our time together is over this morning. I remember when she was about eight years old, my niece, Margot, called me and announced that she had just had an apostrophe. <laughs> she meant epiphany, but I loved the idea of having an apostrophe. And so I hope that we all enjoy at least one apostrophe, you know, maybe a semicolon, at the very least a comma. <laughs> Uh, today. So this, this story of Fierce, um, I did start out as a teacher. Uh, I started out teaching in the inner city school district of St. Louis, Missouri. And this is interesting because um, I had gone to college in upstate New York, very preppy girls college, and my student teaching, my very biggest challenge was that I had an actual genius in my class. This boy who was, in a, a, a sen who was a senior and he was only 13 years old. So he had no emotional, social ways of navigating, so everybody hated him. But he was actually a dear, darling boy who was off the charts. And if I said, you know, tomorrow we're going to talk about E.E. E. Cummings, I would go to the library to check out some books on E.E. E. Cummings and guess who beat me there? And he would t check out everything. And he could have taught the class himself, himself if the other students would have tolerated him. So that was my biggest challenge. Imagine my surprise on my very first day of teaching in this inner city district when I very first class, um, I'm in the classroom and the, ki the bell, you know, the first bell rings and kids start coming in and um, what a mix. This was junior high school and you know what a range there is in development at that point. You know, over here there's somebody who looks like she's 11 years old and back here is Tina Turner, Mother Earth, you know. I mean, <laughs> who has been around and can tell you a few stories. And I'm, it was just stunning. And um, so when the bell rang for every you know, class to start, kids sat down except for this one gal who had been standing in the back of the room with a bunch of her friends surrounding her. And she looked like she could handle a Harley, I swear to God. I mean, she was a little, she was a big girl. She looked like a strong girl. And clearly, she had a gang. And so they didn't sit down. So at some point I said, hi, you guys back there, would you take a seat so we can get started? And she turned to me and suggested that I do something to myself that would have been anatomically challenging. <laughs> and I remember thinking, okay, where in my training was I prepared for this? And I wasn't, of course. And being a Southerner, I grew up in Tennessee, so I'm a Southerner true and true, and Southerners typically deal with things with humor, tough things with humor. And so I, I don't know where this came from, but I just said, you know, that is a novel and interesting idea, but now is not quite the time or place for that. Thank goodness one of her buddies laughed. And then another buddy laughed, and then she laughed. And they went and sat down, and thus began two years of hell on earth. <laughs> <laughs> it 
We, I mean, it was an armed camp. We literally hired police staff to come in and patrol the parking lot so the kids wouldn't slash the tires, patrol the hallways so the kids wouldn't slash themselves or the teachers. Never saw the principal. I could have been teaching those kids to build bombs or make meth. <laughs> they could have taught me, actually, I think. <clears throat> I just was trying to survive. I think I was a terrible teacher. I mean, really. I, I don't even remember a lot about it. Some events are so horrible that you just try to erase it from your mind. And I remember how depressed I would be every Sunday afternoon. It's like, oh, what? Uh, so it, I got through those two years, but it was just really scary, and you never knew what was going to happen, and there was no one to, to help you or to uh, advise you or to commiserate with you, really. Oh, and the teacher's lounge, my God, you open the door. You couldn't even see through it because of the cigarette smoke. <laughs> this was back in the, what was this? This was in the um, early 70s when everybody was smoking. I was too, and um, you know, I, a lot. <laughs> and it was, you know, I'd go home and my clothes would just reek. Oh God, it was horrible. But um, so then my husband joins the Air Force, and off we go. And I have my two daughters, and I have five glorious years of being able to be a mom, you know, stay home with my daughters. And we traveled around all over the place. And then when he got out, we, we both were teaching in where he had been raised, which was in Alma, Missouri, which is in the middle of official nowhere. But it, I mean, it is a farming community. and. Um, and I had several years there, and that experience I loved because I had some of the kids I had more than once during the day because I taught something different every hour of the day. And um, it was such a tight, small community, everybody knew everyone. And in addition to, you know, composition and speech and poetry and mass media and theater, whatever else I taught, I don't even remember now. Um, I went to all their ball games, and they would come over to the house on the weekends and sit out on the back steps and tell me about their boyfriends and their girlfriends and, you know, what was going on in their lives. It was, it was a total 24-hour-a-day, nine months of immersion into their lives, and the principal was fabulous. Curtis Bulig, I loved that man. He was funny. He was encouraging. He'd be around, but not, you know, like he was breathing down your neck. Um, I remember I was teaching in an open classroom. There were four other classrooms in that. In this, all we had were these little partitions that came up about this high, and somebody on this side of me, somebody on this side of me, and two right over there. So I had to, I had to do a whole song and dance show just to keep their attention. I was given the entire football team in my poetry class because they lacked a credit that they needed. These boys looked like sides of beef. A couple of them looked like the whole beef. They were big boys, they were farm boys, and they were not remotely interested in being in a poetry class. And can you imagine these guys in there sitting there, I mean, not even really fitting the desks? And I thought to myself, I have an obligation to them. They they only know this world, you know, this, it's a relatively small world, and um, I want to introduce them to some other things, and I remember saying to them, I bet you guys, you know, you're all athletes, and I imagine you think that a male ballet dancer is a real uh, flake, right? Or worse, you know? And I showed them a film of, it wasn't, um, Baryshnikov, and I cannot remember who it was, but it was a very famous male ballet dancer working out. And they, they started like this, and then pretty soon they're going, holy shit, you know, I mean. <laughs> and when it was over, I said, can you do this? You know, do you think you could do that? I mean, this man is an athlete. I just, I just want to open your, open your eyes to what's out there. 
And I said, Ann, you're going to write some poetry, and it's not going to rhyme, and it's not going to go da 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 I love that. I love that. But then uh, we moved to Seattle so that my husband could do some graduate work at the University of Washington. And I thought to myself when we moved, I'm not sure that I <clears throat> want to continue teaching in high school because I had two relatively young daughters of my own and I was not getting to spend any time with them for nine months of the year. I mean, I would come home and do six different lesson plans or I'd be at play practice, or I'd be at a ball game, and so it was nine months, very, very intense, and I thought, I, I, I should check out to see what else is out there. And I went to um, a headhunting firm, and I ended up interrupting the woman who was interviewing me, and I said, I want to do what you're doing, and I ended up getting hired and became a headhunter. Uh, one of my first clients, I went over to an office, there's this guy who's running the company, who looks like he's about 17 years old, he had I think 14 employees at the time, no furniture, barefoot. It was Bill Gates. So I kicked off my high heels and sat on the floor and we ordered pizza and Coke and we sat around and he told me what they needed and I said, yeah, I have no idea what that is, but if you educate me, I'll go find you the best I can find you. You know, probably, I think we placed the first 150 people in the company before they took it internally, which they did need to do. But I mean, it was a learning curve because I didn't know anything about business. I was an English major for heaven's sake. But it was fabulous and I was promoted to managing a branch and then became the vice president of the company and I had great people around me, just fabulous people. Sometimes they gave me the feedback that I was a little harsh when I would tell them what I expected. For example, one of the Women uh, was constantly, when I'd ask her about, you know, what's going on with this client, and she'd say, well, they haven't gotten back to me, they haven't returned my phone call, I've left a message, you know, I've left two messages, and this was a constant thing I heard from her, they haven't returned my phone call, they haven't returned my phone call, and I finally one day I said, why don't you make yourself the kind of person whose phone calls get returned? She was furious, turned red, the next day her phone calls got returned, I don't even know what she did. I don't even know what she did, but she did something. So she, she stayed mad at me for decades. We're, we're, we're cool now. But I mean, she was mad at me for decades. So I'm not really proud of my leadership style. It, was, it could also have been described as good, 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 bye. Because I would just hold it in, stuff it in until finally, you know, and I would, so I had a lot to learn, tons to learn about that. And eventually I realized I miss teaching. I really do miss teaching. And I ended up teach, uh, facilitating a five day, very intensive human potential course, sort of like ESP, but without as many of the weird requirements and restrictions. But it was, it was pretty profound and it really shook me up and taught me a lot. And then I was, I had left my marriage. I don't mean to just toss that out as an aside. That was, you know, big deal. But I had left my marriage and, uh, and I was dating a guy who was, was, he was, he was chairing uh, a group of CEOs in Seattle through the auspice of, of a large organization headquartered right here in San Diego. It at the time was called Tech. It's TEC stood for the Executive Committee. And he heard that they were thinking they needed to hire a female chair. They didn't want to, but they feared they would get sued if they didn't. So he suggested me, long story short, I end up taking this on. And what this job entailed was um, meeting with each one. So these were up to 16 non-competing CEOs. And they couldn't even do really significant business with one another because this had to be a place where there would be no reason why they could not fully disclose anything and everything that was going on. So I would meet with each one of them once a month for about two hours, sort of a come to God chat about what was going on in their companies and in their lives. And then once a month, they would spend the entire day together 
to advise one another on their most pressing issues. It was extraordinary. And I ended up with two groups and then a group of their key execs. And, um, oh, I learned so much, so much about business. I couldn't believe some of the conversations and the issues that I had the privilege of sitting in this 50 yard line seat as all of this was being disclosed and we were working on this. And it was a beautiful thing. And very often what would happen was a CEO would come in and he'd say, you know, this is the issue, this is why it's important, and, you know, here's what we're planning to do, I'm, I'm considering these options, this is the one I think is the best. So I'm about ready to pull the trigger on that and the group would say, well, hang on, and they'd be talking, 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 talking. And at some point the group or an individual in the group would come up with an option nobody had thought of that was so elegant, so stunning, that we would just sit there unable to speak for a moment. It's like, wow, didn't see that one coming. That is so good. And so they became very successful CEOs. Their companies grew, grew, grew. Some of them you would know. So I hadn't had much training when I started in that role, and I offered to create a training for my peers. But there were only 44 people when I was hired. And eventually, when I finally left 13 years later, there were 500 from all over the world. And so I did, and each year there would be a gathering of everybody. Everybody would come to San Diego or eventually Irvine. And um, at some point I would lead a two-day training for all of the international chairs. And I loved that because I love being with people from other cultures and learning about their countries and their lives. So picture this. I had married the guy I was dating, and we had been together for 10 years, and it had been very painful and very difficult. And I never could quite understand why, and again, had realized that whatever I had tried was ineffective, and I didn't feel that he was interested in really doing what it would take. And so we had separated. So now this is, I'm, I'm 0 for 2, right? <laughs> I am sitting there, we're in Irvine, California. He, for the first time, is not sitting beside me. He's back here somewhere. We had invited a man named David White, W-H-Y-T-E. If you don't know of him, you might want to get the book, The Heart Aroused. It is a beautiful book. The subtitle is the reason why nobody buys it. The subtitle is Poetry and the Preservation of the Soul in Corporate America. Yeah, no, that's not good. But it's a fabulous book. And he had been asked to keynote. And he, I had, I had already had one apostrophe before he showed up. You know, I'd had about 10,000 hours of conversations with these CEOs, and I was reading Hemingway's The Sun Also Rises, in which a character is asked, how did you go bankrupt? And he says, gradually, and then suddenly. And my apostrophe was that our careers and our organizations and our relationships and indeed our very lives succeed or fail, gradually, then suddenly, one conversation at a time. So I, you know, I was really clear that I wanted the people that I was working with, and myself, to pay attention during gradually. How are we trending? So that we wouldn't arrive at a negative suddenly and say, what happened? Didn't see this coming. So to stay awake during gradually, so we could course correct if we need it. So now here's David White standing up there in all his wonderful uh, North Yorkshire accent because he's from England. And at one point he said, do you know the young man who's newly married is often perplexed, even a little frustrated, even perhaps a little irritated because this lovely person to whom he has plighted his troth that's how they talk in England. And with whom he hopes to spend the rest of a glorious life, insists 
on appearing before his face on a regular basis, wanting to talk yet again <laughs> about the thing they just talked about last night or last weekend, and so often it has something to do with the quality of their relationship. And he wonders, why are we having this conversation again? Could we have one really big conversation about our relationship and then coast for a year or two? You know, but here she would be again. And David said, long about age 42, and he smiled because he was 42 and married at the time. He said, long about age 42, if he's been paying attention, it dawns on him this ongoing, robust conversation that I have been having with my wife is not about the relationship. The conversation is the relationship. For me, the penny dropped. I just was really struck. That explained everything. Does that do anything for you, that idea? The conversation is the relationship, just nod your head if it does. So if you do see something to that, if there is something to this notion that the conversation is the relationship, then if you and I add another topic to the list of things we are unable to talk about, because it wrecks another weekend, it wrecks another meeting at work, then all of the possibilities for that relationship grow smaller. And all of the possibilities for the individuals in that relationship grow smaller. Until you notice, I am making myself quite small, behaving as if I'm just a space around my shoes, engaged in yet another three-minute conversation that is so empty of meaning it crackles. So I sat there and I listened to all of that, and I felt like David was talking directly to me, and I discovered later on that everybody in the room felt the same way. We all wanted to run out into the parking lot and phone home. The very next day, I was to lead this two-day session with the international chairs, and rather than going to the banquet, the big party that night, I stayed in my hotel room. I literally tore up the outline of the thing I had been leading for, gosh, I don't know, six, seven years and started all over again. And the next day when these 14 people from around the world showed up, I said, put your seatbelts on because I, have, I think there is some place deeper and richer that we can go. And you can tell me if it's not working. Tell me if you hate it. I can always revert back to what I've been doing for years and years. But I just really want to try this, and I'm, 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 I'm quite anxious about it. Well, by noon, we were gobsmacked. We were several people were in tears. We had trouble breathing <laughs> because we had, we had tapped into something that was richer than we tapped into before. At the end of the two days, these guys went out and started telling the whole world, you know, this is the, the, the most profound training I've ever had. And the phone began to ring and people said, come teach, come teach, come teach, come, you know, do this for me, do this for, and then Presidents started saying, come and do this for my team, my executive team. I want, I want us to operate this way. And so I was really, really busy. And then people were saying, would you please write this down? Please write this. This needs to be a book. And I didn't want to write this down. I don't read nonfiction. I'm sorry, but I don't. I read fiction, really good fiction, and the occasional really good thriller I love. But I don't, you know, I always thought I would like to write, but I wanted to write literary fiction, not nonfiction. So I said, no, 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 sorry. Meanwhile, the divorce is final, and I'm thinking, okay, wow, can I keep my house? You know, how am I going to manage financially? And I had had this idea for a dot com, and I developed it. I spent about $25,000 I really didn't have to just throw out the window on a, an incubator team to help me flesh this idea out in the business plan. And, and then I started pitching it to venture capitalists, all of whom said, mm, no, I don't get it. Then I remembered a guy in San Diego who was richer than God. And I called him and I said, I'm going to fly down and pitch an idea to you. And he said, no, yeah, you can tell me over the phone. And I said, no, no, I'm come down. And I did. And I pitched the idea to him. And he said, mm, don't get it. And I said, well, 
let me leave it with you, because if you don't get it, it's not that it isn't a good idea, it's that I couldn't pitch my way out of a paper bag. I, this is a new world to me. I, I, don't, I don't really like this process. I don't enjoy working with VCs. I don't enjoy trying to sell this idea. I still think it's a great idea, so you can keep it. Throw it away if you want. And I left and I went back home, and this was December, when I always have my, one of my fierce conversations with myself. You know, is there something that when I get to the end of my life looking back, I will regret not having given my best to it. Um, and the answer came in, oh, was so clear. It was almost like a, an actual voice in the room. It said, you need to write the book. And I remember thinking, oh, I will, I, this, will be, this will never get published. Nobody will ever read it. I'll send it out, I'll, I'll be able to paper the bathroom with rejection slips. And I, um, I'm gonna do it. And when I said yes, I'm gonna write this book, it felt, I was just washed with this feeling of yes, this is, what, this is what I need to do. Even if I go broke, even if I can't keep the house, can't pay the bills, you know, I, I need to write this book. After I made that decision, about half an hour after I made that decision, let it wash over me and it felt so good, phone rang, guess who it was? The guy in San Diego who said, I got it. I'm gonna give you 10 million to start and I'm gonna raise the rest of the money you're gonna need down the road as long as you agree to run the company. And I said, can I call you back? <laughs> hung up and thought, okay, God, you are messing with me. You are messing with me. This is a serious test because I you know, had all these money concerns and I just knew it wasn't the right thing to do. So I called him back and I said, you're going to think I'm nuts, but I've just changed my mind. I'm not going to do it. If you want the plan, you can buy it for 25 grand. I'll give it to you. That'll, I'll break even then on it. He bought it. I was so glad. And right after that was the dot-com crash big dot-com crash. That thing would have tanked. It would never have been successful, and I would have wasted, squandered other people's money, which would not have been okay with me. But I also had recognized that, like Annie Dillard says, how we spend our days is how we spend our lives. And I really didn't want to spend my life running a dot-com. That's not why I was here. So I wrote the book. And I got a book on how to write the perfect book proposal, and I wrote the perfect book proposal. And I sent it out. To make a long story short, there was a bidding war in New York, and I was offered a million dollars for the book by Viking. That does not happen. It was timing and luck, and a really good book proposal. And then I'm thinking, okay, you know, my agent's going to take 15%, Uncle Sam's going to take a big hunk, but still, I'm going to have a nice, serious amount of money for the first time in my life. I have a little runway here. What do I want to do with this? And that was where even my ex-husband was saying, don't start a company. Are you crazy? Just keep writing books. My gosh, you know, you don't have to supervise anybody. You don't have to have payroll. You don't have to have all those issues. Don't start a company, but I realized I needed to start a company because of the response whenever I would go and lead a training or give a talk about the fierce principles and practices, the people's response was so wholehearted. It was like we were all starving for the same thing. It wasn't just me. So I knew I had to start a company, and I did. And um, so here we are. Here we are today, tw what, 12 years later, um, and we are a small group relatively. We have, I think, 27 or 28 employees in our Seattle offices. We have some partners around the world, um, and I get emails all the time from people saying not only did, and I, I mean, it might be from Russia, it might be from Indonesia, it could be from France, it could be from the US, saying not only am I having better conversations at work, but I'm having better conversations at home. So I, I wanna shift to 
some things that happened after starting the company. I used every, well, I bought myself a new car. I did do that. I bought myself a new car. Everything else went to starting the company and hiring people. And I want to um, share with you some of the key things that I think have really been powerful for us under the banner of building capacity. I knew what I wasn't good at. I knew I wasn't good at bookkeeping, accounting, numbers. I knew I wasn't good at administrative stuff and details. Very easy for me to hand those things off to somebody who was good at it and, and hold them able to handle it. I had an iron grip on program design, so the design of our workshops, um, the design of our materials, which I have to say have won all kinds of awards, um, and on who our facilitators were. And my vision was that I would personally select a stable of world-class facilitators. And I knew a lot of them at that point. And every single one of them wanted to be a part of this. And I would train them and vet them and make sure they were really on their best game. And then we would send them out to our clients. And they would lead the programs. So one of our employees named Cam came to me one day and he said, you know, um, I was just talking with this company and they were asking about train the trainers. You know, they want us to train their trainers uh, so that they can lead this. And I said, oh, yeah, right, over my dead body because the, no program is any better than who leads it in front of the room. So that's not going to happen. And Ken says, right. So he goes away <laughs> and then he comes back a couple of days later, and he says, let me, let me run this by you again. This is not the only company that is saying, we want you to train our trainers. And again, I'm saying, that's just not going to happen for the reasons that I shared with you. They just, they won't be good enough. They won't be strong enough. Plus, if they're internal, their peers won't have the same degree of respect for them that they do from an outside expert. All these, I had a whole long list of reasons. Sam says, or Cam says, okay. And he came back to me a week later and he says, okay, you don't get it. They are not going to work with us. They're not going any further. This company, this company, this company, some big companies, unless we do train the trainers. So you have to de decide whether you want this business to grow and to get this message out there or whether you want to be controlling and not hold other people able and um, have a stable of facilitators who you know how egotistic they all are anyway. It's like herding cats. Do you really want to have this group of facilitators that you have to look after and feed and clothe? And I, I, I finally got it. And I said, you know what? This really scares me, but let's, okay, let's do it. And we've got to set the bar really high. We have to have a train the trainer experience that scares the pants off people coming into it. We need, we need to tell the companies, send us your A players. Don't send us anybody but your A plus trainers. We will send them ahead of time the piece that they're going to have to come prepared to give. We're going to send them videos so they can watch it over and over how many times they want to. They need to come prepared to deliver with, without a, a piece of paper in their hand. They can't be reading to everybody. And uh, we're not going to say that we're automatically going to bless everybody that comes. They have to be really good. And that's, so we started doing that. Um, it has been, it's been just amazing and it, very humbling because those trainers out there in the world and various organizations are doing some of the most incredible, rich work and in part because they understand their industries far better than an outsider ever would. They understand all of the issues that the people in their organizations are dealing with. They speak the language. They understand all the three-letter acronyms. 
And what, the, one of the ideas that they really, truly latched on to, and they kept coming back and talking about this, these external trainers, not only do I totally get that we are succeeding or failing gradually then suddenly one conversation at a time, not only do I get that the conversation is the relationship, so that every conversation that any of us has is either enriching, flatlining, or harming a relationship, but I also get that our most valuable currency as an individual, as a team within an organization, as a company, is not IQ, it's not money, it's not the ability to build a cool PowerPoint deck, the ability to speak many languages, the MBA uh, degree that I have, our most valuable currency is relationship. It is emotional capital, which we are either gaining and acquiring or squandering one conversation at a time. In fact, I want to share with you this thought, and this is in the second book, Fierce Leadership. I really focus on this. I feel that the next frontier for exponential growth for an individual, an organization, whether it's a company or a school, or a school district, and the only sustainable competitive edge lies in the area of human connectivity. And we don't know how to do that human connectivity. How do we connect with people? And my sense is that if you want to be a great leader, a great spouse, a great teacher, a great Sam, a great principal, you must gain the capacity to connect with the people who are important to your success and your happiness at a deep level or lower your aim. You know, there are a lot of people who have the title leader, title this, title that. It doesn't mean that they're great. It doesn't mean that extraordinary things are happening in their worlds. So this learning to connect at a deep level is where the significant differentiation is. And this is one of the reasons why Fierce has been brought into some MBA programs because a lot of companies have stopped sending people through an MBA program because they don't see any value in it. They come out, they're able to read a spreadsheet, analyze a case study, and so can everybody else on the block. With a company like Microsoft, for example, being smart, phew, you have to be smart. You have to be off the chart smart to even get in the door. Being smart does not distinguish you in any meaningful way. Everybody in the organization is smart. What is going to make the difference for you? And I remember the very first workshop I ever did with a bunch of Microsoft people, the guys put this black plastic rat on the table. And they said, this is our mascot. We are programmers, and we like to live in the dark. And we don't want to have conversations. We're not interested in this. We're only here <clears throat> because we were told we had to be. And I said, well, I think when you're programming, it really helps to be in the dark and not to be bothered, and you don't need to have conversations. But do any of you hope to someday marry or <laughs> have a family? Do you think that maybe 20 years from now, you might want to have been promoted into something else? I mean, do you think you might want to expand your repertoire <clears throat> as a human being, as a professional? You know, if you don't, if you want to stay here and be here when you retire or keel over or go blind from staring at the monitor forever, then don't change a thing. But if you have any other aspirations, you know, this might serve you. So I think it's really important to, to explain what a fierce conversation is because this is something that people quite understandably get a little wrong. I know the word fierce has connotations to it. It's why I chose it. And luckily, I was advised to write into the contract with Viking that I had control over the title, because the first thing they wanted to do was change it to powerful conversations, which would have absolutely ensured no one would have even looked at the book. 
I wanted it to be fierce so that somebody would say, what is that? And at least pick it up and turn it over and read something about it. So if, if a fierce conversation was the kind of conversation you craved and you wanted to have over and over and over again, what are some words that occur to you that could describe a fierce conversation? Positive words. You can shout them out. I can't. Be passionate? Honest. Honest. Pardon? Impactful. Yes, yes. Yes. Sorry? Enlightening, yeah. I mean, they're the you know, honestly, my picture of a fierce conversation is almost like building a campfire. Um, and up at the treehouse, I do that quite often. And when my family comes up and friends, we do s'mores and the whole thing. But when you build a campfire, when you begin to engage someone or a whole room full of people in a fierce conversation, Pretty soon, I mean, people are attracted by the warmth, attracted to the wood smoke. They bring their own logs, add to the fire. The fire becomes bigger, more beautiful, attracts more people. And pretty soon, we're sitting around the campfire telling our stories. The simplest definition of a fierce conversation is one in which we come out from behind ourselves into the conversation and make it real. Now, you may be thinking, what's the big deal with that? I'm pretty real. Well, perhaps you are. Many people are not. Many people are very afraid of real. In fact, I just had a conversation with someone here yesterday about this. I've got this political situation going on. If I said what I'm really thinking, you know, if I said what I really want to see, even though I am in a position of relative power, I think, it won't go well, you know, so I've been holding back. We're very afraid of real. And yet, I think it's the unreal conversations that ought to scare us to death. They're incredibly expensive. Literally, emotionally, professionally, results-wise, they're very, very expensive. We want to have conversations with the people who are central to our success and our happiness that, that are real. We want cultures of honesty and candor and collaboration and mutual respect. We don't want cultures filled with triangulation where person A bonds with person B over their mutual loathing of person C, <laughs> who doesn't have a clue or maybe senses. That, by the way, if, if, you know, that's a human thing that we want to do sometimes is go to somebody and talk about somebody else. That's toxic. It's toxic. So, you know, if you're doing that, stop. Stop. Um, we want to tell the truth. We want to hear the truth. And where we go wrong is we think that we as individuals own the truth about a topic. Maybe because it's the way we were brought up. You know, it's what we've always been told. I remember an old, old story about a newlywed who uh, is cooking for her husband and she has a big pot roast and she cuts off the ends of it and then puts it in the pan. And he says, why are you doing that? And she says, well, my mom always did that. Well, why does your mom do that? And she calls her mom, mom, how come? Because I didn't have an oven big enough to handle <laughs> the whole thing. I was like, oh, really? So we've been taught all this stuff. I recently um, gave some people a whole bunch of dots, little 12, 12 little squares with dots in them and said, why don't you connect the dots and see if any of them look like anything and name them. And they did. They had fun with it. Well, this looks like a penguin and this looks like an airplane and this looks like... And then, and then I showed them. This was the, um, these were the astrological signs. I don't know how somebody got some of the signs they got from the, those stars. It doesn't look like that to me, you know, but somebody named them and that's what we've accepted. That's what they are. People have been telling us stuff for years that we have accepted. 
People tell us that um, feedback has to be anonymous or people won't tell the truth. That is one of the worst best practices out there for so many reasons I can't even tell you. So we have all these things that we've just really accepted. So one of the things about fears is there are four objectives. The first is to interrogate reality. This is not easy, and yet it's important because no plan survives its collision with reality. Whether it's a plan for a school, or a district, or a family, or an organization, or a nation, no plan survives its collision with reality. And reality has this habit of changing, which seriously complicates our fantasies about how things are supposed to go. So we, we need to interrogate reality, and each one of us has our own perspective. In fact, the, the visual that we use is of a beach ball. Each one of us is standing on a different colored stripe on the beach ball around this topic. And so if you say, what color is this topic? Well, I might be living on the orange stripe, but you might be living on the blue stripe. Who's right? What color? It's all of these colors. It's a little bit of everything. So it's so powerful to say, look, this is what it looks like from where I sit. This is what I believe. This is what I feel we should do for these reasons. Now, push back. Tell me what you're seeing that you feel I am missing. You know who's good at this? Robert Redford. When he has a meeting, he will often say at the very beginning of it, I'm going to tell you what I think, and I'm going to invite you then to influence me. I sincerely hope to be different when this meeting is over. And he means it. It's one of the reasons why he's as popular as he is at Sundance and around the world. It's very unusual to be with someone who will say, yes, I'll tell you what it looks like from where I sit, and I want to know how you see it. I really want to know. Take your best shot at changing my mind. My, you, you might or you might not, but I, my goal is not to be right. My goal is to get it right. And that's what the CEO think tanks, that's what we reminded ourselves. If our goal is to be right, we're just kind of doomed at some level, because you can only be right so much of the time. Once in a while, you're going to be wrong. I've been wrong many times, continue to be wrong. My team constantly educates me, gives me pieces of reality from where they're operating that I would never have understood if they didn't. Then, having all of the information, then the best decisions can be made. The best decisions, the problems can be solved. Strategies can be designed that actually work. So we want to interrogate reality in order to provoke learning for everyone in the conversation. We also want to tackle our toughest challenges. And this does have to do with the confronting part of it. I don't know about you, but I've not yet witnessed a spontaneous recovery from incompetence <laughs> or a bad attitude. You know, something that somebody, it does require a conversation and we tend to put it off and off and off because, you know, I tried that last week and I almost got killed. I don't want to do that again. It was not fun. Um, but also, when we interrogate reality and learning is provoked, we tackle our tough challenges with one another so that we stay current. And fourthly, and very importantly, we enrich our relationships with each other in the process, then we've got, we've got a team of people who can just go amazing places. How many was that, Keisha? 30, 30. okay. She's, she's keeping my, she's my timekeeper. Um, so it's, it's bringing it back to Sam's and those conversations that you have, and one of them is about celebration those of you that have been working on that piece, I am so pleased that you are because sometimes the fiercest thing I could say to another human being is, you just rocked that meeting. You just rocked that classroom. I so appreciate and admire the way you responded when so-and-so asked you such-and-such -such or said so-and-so. Keep doing that. Keep bringing that in the door with you, period. Not attached to, 
However, you could be better at so-and-so. When you do that, you've just, you've just killed it. So this celebration conversation is key, and it's very fierce. And how sad that so many of us don't, don't do that very often or find it very uncomfortable. So that is a powerful conversation. Non-directive, going back to my first comment that woe is me is not an attractive narrative. When you have somebody who's sort of not getting it or who's really struggling or who will give you a very long list of really good reasons why they are not succeeding or why they're not going in the direction that you're expecting, um, how do you snap them out of victim mode? Some people are very entrenched in victim mode. I mean, it's really cool. You know, and if, let me, do you want to know why I'm not successful? It's because of this. And it's because of this, and it's, do you know why I'm not doing better in my personal relationships? It's because, you know, I was raised by demons. I have no <laughs> idea, you know, how to do any of this. Do you want to know why, you know, and we listen, and, you know, and if we don't buy that list, they open their, I've got a whole other list here. The people who are my friends will buy my list. The people who don't buy my list are insensitive jerks. And yet, when we're around people who do buy our list, part of us loses respect for them. It's, it's an interesting dynamic. Oh, okay, you're buying my sad story. Hmm. And at some point, usually even we realize that this sad story is not changing anything at all. So we have a conversation that, you know, in Delhi's course that is so powerful. It's, a, it's the exact conversation that I used to have with the CEOs. Um, and it is questions only until you get to the very, very end, and then you might be able to add one suggestion, but it's not your normal sort of coaching or supporting conversation, but it will get people out of victim. There is nowhere to go. In fact, one of the things that happens, I'll share with you if you haven't taken that course, if you ever say to somebody, what do you think you should do about this? Or what are your thoughts about this? And they say, I don't know. I don't know. Then what you want to say is, well, what would it be if you did know? They won't thank you for that. You have to be careful how you say that. You know, you could come across as a real, hmm. You don't, so tone of voice is very, very important. But we, you know, we let, there's a lot of people who've been getting away for decades with I don't know. There have been times when I've asked this of someone and they said, well, if I did know, I would do this and this and this and this and there it is. So we, we do know at some level. Or if we don't know, then we need to be with someone who holds us able to dig deeper and figure it out. You know? In a meeting, if you're going around and saying, okay, you know, given everything that we've just talked about together, you know, what do you think we should do? And you notice somebody isn't saying anything, and they say, well, I, I don't know, you can say that. And if somebody says, I don't have anything to add because Sally pretty much said what I would say, then you say, well, what would you add if you did have something to add? <laughs> we, we teach people how to treat us. We teach people what is okay and what is not. And I know you know people who come to meetings, meeting after meeting, and sit there like bumps on a log and never say a thing. And in some way, some invisible way, are sort of sucking the joy and the life out of the room. <laughs> and then they go out, and now they have something to say. You know who they are. This is something you can stop in a heartbeat. You simply say at the beginning, I'm going to ask everyone here to give your best suggestion before we conclude. You've put them on notice and you follow it through. 
And all of this is in both of the books. I, I don't, we're, I'm sorry that we don't have books here for you. I wish we had known this might happen and we would have had books for you, but um, you can find them anywhere, including electronically, you can get them. So it explains exactly how this meeting go, goes. And it's so powerful. And here's another thing about this meeting and this conversation. And this could be one-to-one -one, and this could be with a whole group of people. You, the leader, do not take one single note. In fact, you ask that everyone put their pins down and simply listen to one another. No note-taking. Because I can copy down every word and miss the entire thing that's actually going on in the room. Do you know what I'm saying? You, I know you do. So, I have no idea where I was going to go with all of that, but anyway. <laughs> I, <laughs> oh yeah, okay, I'm coming back now. <clears throat> I wandered off, I tend to do that. Um, but I, I, think, I think the thing that I most want you to know is that Fierce in the Schools is the only division that when I get a call or an email that says, will you come and talk here or do something here, I say absolutely, if I possibly can, if I'm not already booked, I will go. I don't go around giving keynotes and workshops in corporations any longer because it's not where I want to spend my time. I want to be at the treehouse or I want to be with you. Because you, I mean, my gosh, what you're doing is, is so important. And I remember as a child, I didn't have a clue how to navigate. I didn't realize I was navigating one conversation at a time. And I did not know how to talk to my parents. I did not know how to talk to my teachers. I didn't even know how to talk to some of the other kids in school that I sensed didn't like me. I didn't know what to do about any of that. So there's, a, there's this gift I want us to give kids. And the only thing that has frustrated me around Fierce in the Schools Division is that it, a, many, many, many schools have taken it in and taught the principals and the staff and some of the teachers, and then it stops. They are not taking it to the kids, and that's the goal. I mean, if I could get to them and didn't have to go through you, frankly, I'd probably do it. <laughs> but I can, and I understand that. And it's absolutely right to go through you. It has to go through you. And in fact, if you're not modeling what we're doing here, it, it won't work. But I, I, there, are, there are schools that have really taken this to heart. Where I was going to be this morning, right now at this exact time, was at the San Diego courthouse. And I was going to be meeting with the district attorney and the junior district attorney and a teacher named Tressie Armstrong. Kelly Elementary School in Carlsbad, where there was a shooting. And two little girls were injured but not killed. Tressie had, long before the shooting took place, had decided that she wanted her school to be a fierce school. That she wanted all of the principles and practices of fierce to be the way they operated as a school. And she wanted to take it to the kids in the classrooms. And there are various ways to do this, so that at least once a week, kids get some exposure to these ideas, some activity that helps them begin to learn. And things go home to parents, so that the parents are a part of this too. So Tressie wrote an article. Some of you may have read it. It was in JSD. Um, and she talked about what happened. And how the, the role that the fierce culture played during and immediately after the shooting. And it was a rather stunning difference how everybody pulled together immediately. And the kids did exactly as they were told. And even when parents were saying, come here, come here, baby, actually the parents stopped doing that because they realized, no, we know that the teachers and the faculty and everybody is in charge and has these kids' best interests. And the kids did not falter the least bit.
I mean, one of the students was asked by a reporter, you know, you're, you're from the school where that horrible tragedy happened. And she said, I'm from the school where a miracle happened. So Tressie is right now having a conversation because um, there are individuals here in San Diego who really want to take this to all the first responders, you know, to, to the community so that the community begins to become fierce, not just the schools. So if you want to see magic, adopt this yourself and then give it to the students. I can't imagine any parent or teacher or administrator or staff member who would discover something precious and valuable and then hoard it, keep it all to themselves. It deserves to be shared. This morning, this news that we heard that I shared with you about the Salt Lake City School, that would not have happened in a fierce culture. That just could not have happened because of the relationships, the quality of the relationships that exist in a, in a fierce culture. So I'm going to actually close a little early because I only want to say one more thing to you. I want to say that this is not, you know, if, if you think you want these fierce conversations, if you want to have real conversations, if you want to be in meetings and conversations that interrogate reality and provoke learning and tackle tough challenges and enrich relationships, do not for a minute think that it is up to somebody else to make that happen where you live. I hear so often I think all of, all of trainers do. Well, I'd love to have conversations like that, but my boss or my culture wouldn't really support it. That's, that's a victim statement. That's pure victim. So I think you are the culture. You are the culture. Each one of you is a walking hologram of the culture in your organization. And everything that you do, everything that you say, every time you show up, walk through the door, your behavior and the words that come out of your mouth are either supporting a culture that is healthy and powerful and ultimately helping the kids learn and thrive, or you're doing the opposite. There's really not a lot of in-between. The in-between place is just too boring to even mention. So. This is a personal, private, non-negotiable decision that you get to make as a human being, how you want to live your life. And I hope that you will think about this. While no single conversation is guaranteed to change the trajectory of a career, a school, a relationship, or a life, any single conversation can. So I hope you will sit beside someone you care for and begin. Thanks.